On this episode, we learn about the Greenways program in Greenville, South Carolina. Greenville has been recognized as a bicycle-friendly community. We talk about bicyclists and pedestrians with the city administrator of Augusta, Georgia. The International Mountain Bicycling Association meets in Augusta. Finally, North Augusta inaugurates a new pump track. Stay tuned. We're in Greenville, South Carolina, talking with Brian Graham, who's the city's Greenway and Sustainability Manager. What does a Greenway and Sustainability Manager do? Uh, as, as Greenway and Sustainability Manager for the city, I'm responsible for uh, managing and planning for our network of Greenway trails and also uh, delve into uh, the area of sustainability for the city and, and uh, trying to green some of our processes and uh, make sure that sustainability is, is kept in, at the heart of, of some of our decisions that we make. What's your trail system like? Our trail system, uh, I think it's fantastic. In, in 2008, City Council adopted a Trails and Greenways master plan uh, that, that called for uh, it's basically a concept plan for over 120 miles of on-street and off-street shared use paths and, and bicycle lanes. Uh, it's my job to implement that plan. Uh, right now we have about 10 miles of, of Greenway Trail. Uh, the Swamp Rabbit Trail uh, is the, the main spine of our trail system in the city right now. Uh, that consists of about four and a half miles of, of Greenway Trail. And this weekend, uh, we'll be connecting to about nine miles of trail that the County Recreation District is completing. Uh, we'll, so the Swamp Rabbit Trail at the end of, uh, at the end of this week will be a 14 mile trail, uh, a regional trail that connects uh, regional uh, universities and colleges and also uh, neighboring, a neighboring town. Hey, you got the main trail, the Swamp Rabbit Trail, and it's an uh, extension that's about to open up. Uh, how about connections so people can get to that trail? What are you able to do there? Sure. Uh, our, our concept plan is basically a hub-and-spoke model that, that calls for, for several spines. This will be, be the main one. Uh, we're actively pursuing several trail spurs. Uh, the city's goal is, is to basically be within a quarter of a mile uh, of every resident. Uh, to have a trail or uh, some sort of facility. Uh, you know, our trail connects into our, our sidewalk network and also uh, we're actively working to, to expand our, our bicycle facility network uh, on street with uh, sharrows and bicycle lanes uh, to, to really have an interconnected system uh, for bicycles and, and pedestrians. And part of your trail's been around a long time. What sort of problems does that create for you if, after a trail is a few decades old? Certainly, uh, so, some of our trails and, and part of the Swamp Rabbit Trail has actually uh, been, uh, was constructed in the late 70s in Cleveland Park. And those trails right now, are we are actively uh, working to rehabilitate those trails. We just uh, started a million dollar plus renovation uh, project on those trails. We will rehabilitate bridges widen and resurface the trail, address all sorts of drainage and ADA concerns as well, and, and try to improve all the crossings where, where the trail crosses a road or the river, uh, especially with the construction of a new bypass bridge where we, we're currently putting uh, trail users on a very narrow sidewalk uh, that doesn't have a curb lawn. And, but uh, through this project, we'll construct a uh, close to 170 foot uh, bicycle and pedestrian bridge over the river uh, will really uh, address not only a, a safety uh, concern but provide uh, some very nice views of, of the park and of the river itself. What, what, what sort of feedback do you get from the residents on your trail system? What do they think of it? Uh, we have a lot of positive feedback, and I, I imagine that is why uh, City Council continues to be very supportive of, of the trail system and expanding the system and improving uh, the network that, that's currently in place. Uh, I get calls on a you know, weekly basis asking you know, when the next section of trail is going to be open and uh, how do I get from point A to point B uh, and using the trail, using my bike. Uh, 
and really, you know, the, the feedback has been almost entirely positive. Uh, you know, there, there's some concern that, that we're spending, uh, the amount of money that we're spending now in the current economic condition. Uh, but I'd like to share with people, you know, that we have selected local contractors and the money that we're spending on trails uh, goes back into the community and creates jobs in the community. Uh, and, and really, the trails, you know, the most exciting part for me is that, that we're creating something that, that families can use for recreation and transportation, uh, those that don't have access to a vehicle or those who are looking for a low-cost uh, family activity on the weekend can you go and use our, our park system and, and trails. And it's, it's free to use. You can go and, and really have an enjoyable day uh, with your family and, and it doesn't cost you a thing to use the trail. So we're creating uh, you know, a real special feature for the community uh, that, that's available and open to everyone. We're in Greenville, South Carolina, talking with Andrew Meeker, who's an urban designer for the city and chair of the Bikeville Committee. What is the Bikeville Committee? Uh, Bikeville is the city of Greenville's bicycle-friendly community initiative. Uh, it's, it began in 2006 with our city council adopting the League of American Bicyclists Bicycle-Friendly Community Action Plan. So at that point, uh, Bikeville really developed and kind of became a, uh, an official entity of the city of Greenville. It's a 15-member uh, volunteer committee uh, made up of city staff and local bicycle advocates. Uh, they volunteered our various bike month events or our various events throughout the year. Um, they do bike valet, uh, they write letters to the newspaper, um, they help develop various programs, volunteer at our different events. So it's a great organization of local advocates that meets on a monthly basis and really collaborates on the Bicycle Friendly Community Initiative. Uh, in 2009, the city was designated by the League as a bicycle friendly community based on large part from the work of the, the Bikeville Committee. And um, so now that we are a, a bronze BSC committee, uh, Bikeville is now working on developing an action plan uh, to see where we go next to achieve silver or gold or eventually platinum status. So Bikeville is still very active. So you aren't going to be satisfied just getting bronze? No, not satisfied getting bronze. Received some positive feedback from the league on our application, and so we're taking that feedback from the league and developing an updated action plan on that. So one of the items on the action plan is a, a master plan, and currently we're interviewing consultants and we'll soon be hiring a consultant to develop a comprehensive bicycle master plan from the entire city. So we took the feedback from the league very seriously and are working on the action steps and implementation of that for our 2013 uh, resubmission. What goes into a, a bicycle master plan? Uh, you know, when I take one, leaf through it, what am I going to see? Well, uh, it's going to be a lot of background information on the community, kind of where, where are we today, figuring out what some of our baseline data and information is. Right now, we know our mode share information from the 2000 census data. So we need to really figure out what our baseline data is for our mode share. How many bicyclists do we really have out there using transportation every day? Uh, so there's going to be an extensive inventory analysis uh, phase of the, the project. There's going to be a lot of community involvement. We're going to have several community uh, workshops. There's a planning committee already developed um, from various local stakeholders, which includes some of the Bikeville volunteers, but also includes some business owners, representatives from the healthcare industry locally. And so that group is going to be key in kind of shaping the plan. Um, and we're going to talk to every different kind of cyclist that there is, people that don't even maybe have a bicyclist. We want to get feedback from them on why they don't bike and what are some of the obstacles and opportunities to get them on the bike. And then we're also going to talk to elite cyclist. Greenville's home to uh, the professional cyclist George Hincapie. And uh, we'll certainly want to get input from a uh, road cyclist and elite cyclist. And so hopefully uh, in the end, we'll have a very balanced plan that, that looks at all the different cyclists, all the different infrastructure opportunities, and then an action plan and an implementation plan on how we're going to thread it all together. And you're going to be talking with a lot of different people here. Uh, why is it essential you do that and just not try to draw something up sitting by yourself in your office? Well, we need, we need buy-in. And so as, as the project 
gets completed, you really have to think about, well, where does it go next? And if we haven't, if we haven't done our job in uh, presenting the concept and integrating the public input into the plan, then there most likely won't be any buy-in not only from the public, but also from maybe the politicians and the decision makers and those who write the checks and, and uh, agree to appropriate money. So the, the more stakeholders we can get involved, the more people that we can get involved and passionate about bicycling, whether it's through safe routes to school, uh, whether it's through walkable communities, whether it's a lifestyle issue, a health issue, a community issue, that's why it's going to be important for us to go out, do the outreach, you know, talk to Greenville's underserved citizens who a lot of times don't have the voice. Uh, some of these people that are waking up at six o'clock in the morning to ride their bike the wrong way down the street to this construction job, we need to reach out to them. We need to understand how we can help facilitate their journey to work and their daily trip better. And so that's one of the reasons and several reasons why we need that community input. What's this bridge behind us? Uh, this bridge, this is Liberty Bridge, and it's over the Reedy River. Um, this entire park is uh, Falls Park. And uh, actually where we're standing right now, uh, about 10 years ago, actually was a street, was a road, was a bridge over the Reedy River. Uh, Greenville's community and leadership, political leadership specifically, envisioned this park and this becoming a pedestrian space. Uh, so we worked with our SCDOT, our Department of Transportation, the statewide Department of Transportation who own Camperdown Bridge, uh, worked out a agreement to demolish the vehicular bridge and then the city took over the initiative and built Falls Park. Okay. Name Falls Park because you have the falls right here. What did that do then to you know, sort of open up the falls and, and have the pedestrian bridge here where you have a great view of it. It, it, did, it did several things for our community. Uh, there's a substantial economic development impact to the bridge. Uh, this park investment was about $12 million investment and that was uh, comprised of both private and public monies. Um, but the adjacent economic development impact has been over $130 million. So we've looked at all of our tax revenue information from the opening of Falls Park in 2001, and we've, we've seen substantial redevelopment. Uh, we, we're also now seeing redevelopment along the Reedy River, which runs north-south from this point. And so there's a development behind us um, that's called River Place. And that's a huge 20 something million dollar redevelopment mixed use project that if it had not been for Falls Park and the Reedy River redevelopment, that project probably would never really have been inspired. And so we've seen a lot of positive economic development impact, but it also kind of bridges the community. I mean, it's lit, it's literally a bridge, but it's also socially a bridge. There were, there were neighborhoods on both sides of this, uh, this river that were not physically connected and now they're physically connected and they're socially connected as well. So it's a community bridge um, and it's also a physical pedestrian bike bridge. We're in Augusta, Georgia talking with Fred Russell who's the city administrator. What does the city administrator do? I actually run the day-to-day -day operations of the city. We've got about 200,000 people, about 2,700 employees, and uh, we provide services from a wide range of things, all the way from garbage pickup to police protection. Now this week, the International uh, Mountain Bike Association is having their World Summit here in the city. Uh, why did you want to have them here? Uh, some selfish reasons. I'm a, I'm a cyclist and like to ride. Uh, we've got a history of, uh, of cycling events here. The Tour de Georgia came through and started here a couple years. Some other cycling events. Cyclocross is real big. And one of the services we provide for our, our community is recreation and we want to highlight that. And mountain biking, people think of you know Utah, Colorado, California. Uh, what do you have in the way of mountain bike facilities here in Georgia? We're sort of proud of the fact that we got the Mountain Bike Association without any mountains. But right across the river, we've got one of the epic trails for the, the Fats Trail. That's a, a wonderful opportunity there. Here in our city, we've got trails that, that run around and, and do that. So uh, you don't have to have a mountain to mountain bike. We've, we discovered that. And uh, have these trails been popular since you've gotten them opened up? Oh, sure. We've uh, lots of people there. We've got our own Swarber chapters. We've got our own people doing that. And uh, people are coming from uh, miles and miles now to ride our trails. 
In addition to that, we had the, the world's largest uh, half marathon, half uh, triathlon just uh, last September. They're coming back, so that gave us some more exposure too. So we think Augusta is a great place for, for different kinds of sports, and mountain biking is one of them. And back to more day-to-day -day biking just to get around. Uh, what sort of issues do you deal with on bicycle transportation, pedestrian transportation uh, in the city on, uh, just to get around? You know, we, we are fairly spread out with the 334 square miles. We don't really have a lot of uh, uh, areas that would be conducive to bike transportation. Most of the time, you unfortunately have to get in a car and, and to get any place around here. What we're trying to do is concentrate some of our developments, look at some of our zoning, look at some of our planning issues, to start developing neighborhoods again, like the neighborhoods we had in the past, where you could work, where you could shop, where you could live without having to get in a vehicle. Uh, some of the things we're looking at are communities that uh, would be able to provide that, which provide pedestrian and, and bicycling traffic is the most optimal way to get around. And you're going to be dealing with the, the, the private sector when you're building new places. Uh, how receptive have they been to, to these ideas? Uh, that you know, In some places they might call it new urbanism or some other concepts. Uh, is that caught on here in Georgia? Uh, here it has at Augusta. I mean, we've got money that we're throwing into those kind of projects. And, and you know, the private Private developments is motivated by what makes money, and that kind of uh, thing now is starting to make money. Uh, people, you know, don't want a 30-mile commute to work. They want to be able to walk. They want to be able to walk out their door and shop, and and maybe work walk to work or whatever. So uh, those are the kind of things becoming popular, and, and we'd like to think we're beginning to be on the cutting edge of that. And Augusta is a fairly historic town, so uh, some of the older parts, the historic parts. Uh, how have they held up for getting around by foot? Uh, fairly well. I mean, obviously, we've got some issues with sidewalks because we've got trees that have been here for hundreds of years, and we're replacing the sidewalks, replacing the forest canopy to some degree. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity. If you walk down our main street, you'll, you'll see that it is fairly pedestrian-friendly, uh, and we're quickly becoming a, a city that has shops and lofts and, and places that people can live and enjoy themselves. We're in Augusta, Georgia, talking with Mark Eller, who's the communications director for the International Mountain Bicycling Association, or IMBA. What is IMBA? Uh, IMBA is an association of mountain bike clubs. We're member-based, so we have about 35,000 individual members, and uh, they make up our 700 clubs that are primarily in North America, but around the world, uh, Australia, Europe, all, all, all over the place, really. And why were you in Augusta this week? We had our uh, biannual uh, summit gathering where we bring together advocates from all across the country and around the world. We have about uh, a dozen nations represented at this summit. And uh, we get together to talk about uh, promoting biking on uh, natural surface trails and uh, ways to make that happen, share our knowledge, and strengthen our movement. And talk about biking on natural surface trails. People hear mountain biking and they think mountains, but you know there aren't any mountains in this part of georgia right what is mountain biking yeah mountain biking is, is what you make of it for sure i mean some of the best trails in uh, the, this country in the u.s are in florida of all places and people are always surprised to learn that but one of our uh, designated imba riding centers is in uh, santos trail system in florida and uh, you'll find great riding in places that you wouldn't expect places from coast to coast and not just colorado and california People that have never done you know, mountain biking, you know, they're out there on the rail trails or on the streets, and they start hearing terms like single track and all these other words that you use. What's all this about? What's right, it's like every other sport. You've got your own uh, lingo going, and some of it can seem pretty alien until you uh, get, it, get the hang of it all. But uh, basically it all comes down to for mountain bikers wanting to ride in uh, beautiful natural settings and narrow trails, enhance the experience uh, if you're riding there's nothing wrong with riding on a 12-foot wide uh, greenway track. That can be a pleasant day, but the, uh, the level of challenge and excitement and the intimacy with the natural world tends to go up if you start riding on a narrower path. So that's, what, that's kind of the experience that most of us in the mountain biking world crave. And how, how difficult are these trails? I mean, uh, you know, I'm getting out on one of these narrow trails out in the woods for the first time. Am I going to have all these big obstacles I have to get over? Or? Well, uh, at a, at a well-designed area, and that's part of what IMBA does, is provide guidelines for what makes an area well-designed. 
uh, you'll find signage. Usually it's based on the kind of signs you might see at a ski area where a green uh, run is going to be a beginner friendly run and a blue is going to be a little bit more challenging but in the intermediate range and if you see black diamonds or a bunch of black diamonds then you better uh, know what you're doing um, or you know you have to take on some risk with uh, outdoor sports and the key is to make sure that people have the, the signals, the signage um, to know what they're getting into and so that's really important for safety and for risk management and the kind of things that IMBA provides guidelines on how to do right. And IMBA, you've got a lot of volunteers out doing stuff. What's the story with volunteers? Well, we, our uh, volunteers in our national and international network, contribute a million hours of volunteer service to trails every year now. So that's something we've worked uh, through a partnership with the REI on documenting. Uh, our volunteers log into the website and record the hours that their clubs put into trails, and it's a great public service. These trails are open um, almost always to not just mountain bikers, but to the general public for hiking, equestrian use, mountain biking, and uh, we promote the whole shared use ethic where we feel like uh, in most cases people can ride trails and hike them and ride them and it all works together well. When when you get into those more advanced uh, level trails, the thing that might be signed a black diamond level trail, then you're in a situation that might be uh, better for single use and we respect the fact that there should be trails that are hiking only, equestrian only in some cases, but oftentimes, most of the time, we can all get along on the same trails. We have a, a shared trail and you know there's an unpleasant incident. What, what, what's going on? What needs to happen that, that doesn't happen? Because you, know, you, you can have past 99 people and not have a problem and it's that one yeah, nasty exactly incident right. that, that people remember. Yeah, it is and it, it really is. A, the perception of conflicts on trail is often uh, far, far higher and we know this from working with uh, land managers. We're have formal partnership agreements with the National Park Service, the Forest Service, all the federal land managers. We work with them on, on really analyzing what's going on here. And what we find over and over again is the perception of, of incidents of trail conflict are far higher than what actually happens on the trail. But that's not to say that, you know, people don't, from time to time, uh, somebody gets crowded off the trail and feelings get hurt. So we provide uh, education. Um, about how to behave on a trail and we also do a lot of it is passive trail design so if I design a trail that's got a straight shot and a bike can get up a lot of speed that's not going to be a good shared use trail design we're going to come in there and try to put some curves in the trail maybe put some a big rock right next to the trail surface so that that's going to make the the rider check his, his or her speed and uh, create a safer environment for everybody to ride and play together on. Now you talk about the, the, the local clubs and organizations. Uh, how does that work? I mean, what's what's going on? What are you folks doing at yeah. the national organization, and, and, and what happens in the local communities? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're truly a grassroots network. So our clubs, you know, a typical IMBA club might be somewhere between 30 to 300 people, and uh, they'll organize anything from social rides, barbecues. Uh, outreach into their community to maybe get a safe routes to school type program going um, and then get out on the trails and, and work with hand tools or with mechanized tools. Sometimes they work with professional trail builders, uh, but they are very committed to uh, building trails and improving the facilities so that we can ride on, on really well designed um, good trail experiences for everybody. And you talk about you know professional trail builders, uh, there's more to building a trail than just, well, let's put a trail there. Right. What, what, what do people do right? What, what do you have to do right? And what, and what, what are the common mistakes when, when someone that, that hasn't had any training yeah. just decides to build a trail? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, most people don't think about where a trail comes from. Um, and, uh, and in fact, a lot of trails that are well-known trails were really nothing more than game trails for a long time. And then they might have seen more human use. And some of those trails, they developed very organically like that can can be really good trails but often not often a trail needs a professional's hand and uh, that goes back to the 30s and the conservation corps where they're really started to understand what makes a trail a lasting durable um, and a feature that works well with the landscape because it's a lot of it is understanding okay well 
this would not be a great um, plant bed to cut our trail through. We were going to go around that one and we're going to look for a place where we can find a course through the woods that's both a good recreation experience and respectful of the natural landscape. And so now we have professional trail builders that specialize in mountain bike trails and they are amazing. They, they design their trails with rolling dips that keeps the water off the, off the trail surface. It turns out that uh, beyond boots and uh, mountain bike tires, the thing that actually disrupts the trails the most in terms of the trail service is water. And keeping water off the trail is 90% of the battle. And so with trail design so that you're on the side slope of a hill and the water sheets across the trail instead of running down it like a river, you, uh, you, you start to understand the things that can really make a trail last and be a good, uh, durable surface that doesn't require a lot of maintenance. <laughs> We're in North Augusta, South Carolina, talking with Drew Jordan. What's this behind us? This is the Riverview Pump Track, and it is absolutely the most fun you can possibly have on a bicycle. What is a pump track? A pump track is essentially, uh, if you take a BMX track, which a lot of people know what that is, a point-to-point -point track with lots of little moguls and rollers and bank turns and jumps and things like that, take that and kind of shrink it down a little bit and then put everything a little bit closer together on the track. Uh, rollers closer together, the bumps closer together, the turns are a little bit tighter, and then interconnect it all and where it's a constant circuit and then you have yourself a pump track. And the idea behind a pump track is that with only a few uh, initial pedal strokes, you can go around the circuit as many times as your fitness level will allow without actually pedaling the bicycle. So it's an excellent upper body workout, lower body workout, core workout, and it really teaches you how to better utilize your body and, and uh, the terrain to gain momentum and ride smoother and faster. So, I mean, it takes a good rider, makes them great. I mean, it it's, 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 takes a beginner rider and takes them to the next level. So, and that's kind of the, the beauty behind it is you'll see people who have never seen one before don't even know what a pump track is and they just go out there ride it and have an absolute blast on it and then you have riders that are pro level riders that can ride this exact same course and they can have an absolute blast on it so i mean it's really something that anybody can come out and enjoy visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org